I would like to uh, welcome you all to uh, Westwood Unitarian Congregation. We are a welcoming congregation who welcome all, whatever your race, your gender, your age, your education, your financial status, but we are united in our common beliefs and the seven principles that define our actions as individuals, as friends, and as a congregation. Westwood is located and most of us live on the traditional lands of Cree, Blackfoot, Métis and other First Nations. As people of Treaty 6, we are committed to building webs of understanding, appreciation, remembrance and learning together. This week we've been shocked and though perhaps we shouldn't have been, uh, we should have known and we should have recognized the thousands of Indigenous children who have died and lie unrecognized and without investigation into the cause of their death in unmarked graves. That's one of the rights that we afford to all Canadians today. And we did even in, in, in years past that if a person dies, they have a right to a thorough investigation. It's easy to think that the news from Canloops is unique and that as you can see on this slide, there are over 20 residential schools in Alberta and likely the majority of these sites have unmarked mass graves as well. We grieve for the loss of those children and for the continuing harm and faced by survivors and their descendants. As you can see, uh, this uh, slide by uh, Kent Monkman, a Cree native from um, living in Manitoba. He says, let's say it again. Studying history will sometimes disturb you. Studying history will, will sometimes upset you. Studying history will sometimes make you furious. And if studying history always makes you feel proud and happy, you probably aren't really studying history. Our opening hymn this morning is uh, also relates to the land. It's uh, uh, by Sheila, uh, Sheila Kaloran, uh, and, our, and it's entitled "Thank Thankful of uh, We're Thankful for the Land." And I invite you all to uh, sing along with this song. Good, my name is Terry Anderson and I will be your service leader today. Uh, speaking this morning is Larry Thompson, who I will introduce at greater length later in the service. Our technical support is provided by Brenda Jackson and Bill Lee, and our musician, as you just heard, is Sheila Killoran. Um, I invite you to uh, gather your own uh, candle and chalice as a kind of a tradition within Unitarian Universalist congregations uh, to, uh, to, to light a candle. Uh, so uh, I will do this now here and invite you to do it as well.
this is uh, our annual uh, uh, sort of free thinker human humanism uh, uh, service, and uh, we're celebrating that uh, this month because uh, we've we finished a very successful year where we've had. I think between 10 and 15 uh, people come and join us on the last Wednesday of every month. And as you can see, we've had some good reads in COVID times. Uh, I think we, we were reflecting on which book we liked the most and it was a, it was a challenge for all of us. Uh, not only did we learn and enjoy each other, but uh, the conversation we have on these Wednesday night is, uh, is uh, really first rate in my opinion anyways. And we also have a, a democratic process by which we elect books for next year. And so I hope that uh, some of you will uh, join us even for just one of these books. You can see that we have books uh, on uh, uh, critical uh, race theory, on, um, on uh, uh, what is humanism, uh, on nature themes, and a couple on, um, uh, on ecological themes. So uh, you are all welcome and uh, do uh, look, look at our calendar. It'll be announced as the years come by. Our first meeting is September 30th and we were in the delightful position of having to decide whether we wanted to meet via Zoom or face-to-face -face at Westwood, assuming that's possible sometime next year anyways. And uh, it was interesting. We, were, had, we had mixed feelings amongst those who thought well, we were just fine on Zoom and others who felt like uh, they missed the free cookies that we usually we have uh, uh, on Wednesday nights in person. So our opening words are by the Reverend Amanda Pope, a Unitarian Universalist man, minister serving as a clergy at the Washington Ethical Society. It's a humanist congregation with roots in the ethical cultural movement. You might not be aware of it, but there are at least three uh, humanists uh, in their name uh, organizations who uh, who were not originally Unitarians but joined uh, with the Unitarian Universalists um, over the years. So uh, Reverend Amanda Popeye writes, humanism is primarily about who we are connected to, what we think about each other, and how we work for justice in the world. No matter what else they believe, humanists insist on the inherent worth of every person. According to humanists, we are all part of one human family and are connected to the rest of the natural world, part of a cosmic story far greater than we can imagine. Humanists believe that we're in this story together and that our work is to write our chapter with as much love and dignity as we can. In the humanist view, change will happen in our world because we make it happen and a change will take all of us. That's the live reality of deed before creed, the organizing idea behind Unitarianism. In 1866, James Freeman Clark, a Unitarian minister and early organizer of the American Unitarian Association wrote, we think it is possible to have a church and even a denomination organized not on a creed, but on a purpose of working together. Suppose that the conditions of membership was the desire and intention of getting good and doing good. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, ch cherished uh, concerns of, uh, of all uh, Unitarian congregations that, uh, that I've been in is the lighting of candles of uh, joy and concern. I think they help to share personal things in our lives so that we can be attentive to the, to the milestones that are happening within our congregation. So well, um, <clears throat> Sheila plays uh, Leibestrom number three. Uh, I'd encourage you to open your chat window and uh, type in any chats for cares or concerns that you would wish to share with us this morning.
Well, thank you, Sheila. Let's uh, please join me in the affirmation that I, as we read together, may the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, and to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Despite the fact that we have not been meeting together this past year, our expenses have not decreased and many have increased. We rely on the generosity and support of our members and friends, and we invite you to contribute using any of the methods shown on this slide. And we'll also be showing you uh, uh, some of the activities of our Cosmic Connections Youth Group, as they uh, are one of the many programs that we've managed to continue to support uh, throughout this pandemic. Hello and welcome to our Minecraft server. This is Alara Stephanie Cadet, they them speaking, and we're here to give you a bit of a tour of our Minecraft world and explain why we enjoy spending this time together. So this sign is actually a sign that the Unitarian Church of Calgary put in along with the giant happy spring some of the younger kids in calgary have been using our server for some fun and games time together online led by sheila and now we're just going to give you a little bit of a tour here's some cows that we've got going on lucas and mj are on with me we had some minor technical difficulties with the voiceover so it's just me talking. That lovely purple swirl is a portal to the nether, which is where you can get special resources that aren't available on the upper world of Minecraft. Here we've got some sheep that have been sheared. And then this is our waterfall entrance to a secret base. And then you can ride the falls back on up to the village. So Minecraft is where we have been spending a lot of our time in Cosmic Connections. MJ Beard built this base. It's a bed. He's gone to bed so that the nighttime can turn into day. Because there are less monsters in the daytime and it's easier to give you a tour of all of the cool things we've got going on. So all of these houses... We got lucky and we found them in our world, but we have also been building them. This is a track. Again, the Unitarian Church of Calgary has been having a great time on our server. We've also been joined by some of the youth in Utah congregation a few times. But this really cool community center was built by the Unitarian Church of Calgary. We may not have all the answers, but we share the quest, says the sign. You'll see we've got an altar space, and those uh, avatars over there are Lucas and I. MJ's behind the camera, so you can see Lucas and I. We've got some decorative bookshelves. So this entire community center was built in game, and we are going to show you right away the very basics of Minecraft. So what you just saw was a chest being opened with resources that were stored inside. MJ grabbed some of those resources. Oh yeah, we're going to show you the basement as well of the community center. Now, so MJ has the concrete, as you can see, and now he is building with the concrete. Obviously, this is a very basic demo, but you can collect any of the blocks in the entire game. So grass, wood, materials from the trees, and then you can craft them into pretty much sky's the limit. You can make pretty darn near anything, which is why we have so much fun playing this game together. 
So MJ is going to actually take us on a tour from a bird's eye view. He has a magical boat. So as you can see, there are a lot of different biomes. You can see the village from up high, that huge happy spring sign that Calgary made with all the flowers. There are desert biomes and various types of forested biomes. You can even go underwater and all of the materials you can craft with. There's Lucas on the edge of his hobbit hole that he is making, and then this huge pyramid is from a different game. You can see it in the corner of the screen. MJ is planning to craft that in Minecraft as well. So now we're just going to take you on a little bit of a tour of the landscapes, because there are so many different landscapes and it's really beautiful. We really enjoy spending time together. We provide a safe and fun atmosphere for youth from all over to join us and have fun conversations and build whatever they want to build together. We're planning to do some big builds together in the future and hoping to do some curriculum around religious buildings this summer. So temples and synagogues. There's a whole UU curriculum based around various different religious buildings that we're hoping to run over the summer. And now we are just going to watch the sunset as another day sets on our Cosmic Connections youth. We've so far had a great year connecting with youth from Canada and even the States. And some of us get together every single week to play games or hang out on Minecraft and others come whenever they're able to. And that's the spirit of our Cosmic Connections. Good night, folks! Good. Well, uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, Elora. It's nice to see Unitarian Universalism has still got the soul in cyberspace. So I invite you to uh, sing along as we have our musical uh, aff affirmation. Uh, uh, thank you for the uh, for the offertory with, with our own Rebecca Patterson. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive. Good, thank you, Rebecca. Here she's with us this morning in person as well as in recording. So let me uh, introduce our speaker by first introducing uh, humanism. Uh, it's, it's sometimes people have a hard time putting their head around what is a humanist, thinking that, uh, well, they're all human, so we're all humanists, or uh, thinking, um, well, how can I be uh, free? If, if I'm a Unitarian, aren't I by definition a free thinker? So I, I wanted to uh, outline where where our uh, our free think our humanist um, uh, origins are, I guess, and they're hidden in plain sight uh, right within our seven principles. So let me uh, go to the our first principle, which, as many of you know, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And so humanists have really no place for racism or sexism or ageism, economic or educational pre prejudice. But as well as sort of welcoming everyone, we value this diversity and free thinking. And we think that just, just because you, you have a right to disagree and you have the same right to be re repeated with respect and civility. And the second principle, the, ju the justice, equality and compassion in human relations, uh, it, it talks about our, our interest in defending the rule of law and in rational thinking coupled with fairness, justice, and companionship and compassion. 
It also uh, notes that how can you have equity and compassion if people are under vastly different economic conditions? So we fight against economic exploitation, uh, most uh, exploitation, and most notably now the economic dis disparity that is really plaguing Canada and the whole Western world. We have uh, many ultra rich people, but we have a, a much larger number of people who are really struggling these days. Our third principle, the acceptance of one another and encouragement of spiritual growth in our congregations. Some Unitarian Universalist humanists have trouble with the word spiritual. Uh, it has uh, uh, resonates from, uh, of course, theist kind of backgrounds from, from a long time ago. But uh, often humanists interpret it as meaning making. Many find solace in wonder and in complexity of nature just itself. But we also respect other, other people's spiritual and religious belief. And it's interesting, uh, like, like I guess all Protestant denominations were, uh, were prone to uh, split over uh, arguments. And um, uh, there's, a, there's a, a completely different branch of religious humanism, which really values ritual and, and the sort of the, the, a lot of the trappings of, of, of communal activity and secular humanism, which sets as one of its goal to sort of eradicate um, uh, or to at least downplay uh, any of the theistic ideas that uh, humans have held in the past. Our fourth principle is a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And the free and responsible means that you do have a right to dissent. You don't have to go along with the majority, but you have to be, you have to be respectful and you have to be respected. It just focuses on the individual as opposed to group truth, responsibility and thinking. And the fifth principle, the right of conscience and the use of democratic process within our congregation and society at large. Uh, the right of conscience means that the freedom to worship in one's own way, including the right not to worship at all, the right to think differently than other people, and a struggle against groupthink and autocratic leadership. And finally, defending due process and the right to oppose arbitrary decision making. Our sixth principle, the goal of world community with peace, liberty and justice for all. Well, seven of the original signatures of the Human Manifesto, the first one, 1933, were Unitarian ministers. Uh, Unitarians have always been involved in, uh, in, in humanist activities and, and continue to do so today. Humanism focuses on helping people live well, achieve personal growth, and make the world a better place. And I think that resonates well with uh, Westwood's own, uh, <coughs> own uh, uh, logo to uh, rest, grow, and serve the world. And our seventh principle and final one is respect for the independent web of all existence of which we are a part. Through science, we have been much better able to understand, to measure, and to treat many of the greatest challenges of all global life. And if we have learned anything from indigenous wisdom, the science of climate change and COVID-19, it is that we are all deeply interconnected. And a final slide, and I, it's not the place or the time to dwell on it, but uh, I think there's some very serious concerns with what's happening within Unitarian Universalism, both in the States and, and in Canada. And uh, it, in my 50 years of being involved in Unitarianism, uh, it's probably the closest that uh, I've ever seen anyways to a schism, ha a schism happening. And, uh, and I think we have a lot of work to do to regain um, some of the trust in a common purpose that, uh, that we seem to be, have been losing in the last couple of years. Next, let me uh, finally just end with a, a, a quote, uh, whether we are secular humanists or religionist humanists, we prefer reason over superstition, equality over hierarchy, democracy over autocracy, caring over callousness, and peace over violence. So, let me uh, next, uh, I'm really pleased to be able to uh, uh, introduce our guest speaker for this morning. 
Um, Larry uh, Thompson is, is a new friend of our, relatively new, since he uh, uh, joined the Freethinker Book Club. He's been a real asset and a valued member of that club, always has very interesting insights to share with us. And as I've just gotten to know Larry better, I found out that we were brought up in the same Baptist subdenomination. And if you know Baptists, there's many subsets of Baptists. Uh, uh, and, but we were uh, part of the Western Canadian Fellowship and uh, that I was brought up. And we enjoyed uh, the other night, we were trying to recall the names of friends and ministers we had known in common from those days. And we could even remember the names of a few of them, uh, despite the fact that we both have trouble remembering people's names from last week. Uh, Larry, however, was much more committed than I, and he went on to earn a doctorate and be ordained as a Baptist minister. He then went as a missionary with his young family for many years to Indonesia. However, like a number of ministers, he either lost his faith or came to his senses or both. Uh, he returned to Edmonton and he retrained as a computer programmer and founded and continues to own a software development country, company here in Edmonton. So I am very proud to welcome to our pulpit the Reverend, Doctor, and Atheist Larry Thompson. Go ahead, Larry. Well, thank you. Uh, for that introduction. And thank you for the privilege of, of being here and to uh, make this address uh, this morning. Um, I, I've been asked to tell my story. Uh, so I'll launch right in. Uh, as Terry mentioned, I used to be an ordained Baptist minister. For all I know, I still am, but um, I think I might have to go through the process again if I were to join the church again. And again, as Terry mentioned, I spent 11 years with my wife and family as missionaries in, in uh, Indonesia with the Baptist, Canadian, what's now called the Canadian Baptist Ministries, where all of my work was done speaking the Indonesian language. I was a seminary professor, a preacher. I worked in leadership development and lay training. Uh, in a variety of roles. And now I am an, an atheist and I am totally dissociated from the church. Today, I want to affirm the legitimacy of the secular, materialist, naturalist worldview shared by many in the Unitarian Fellowship. I'm aware that today, as we used to say in the church, I'm preaching to the choir and but today I want to celebrate that life makes so much more sense by not trying to fit it into the confines of a supernatural or a religious framework. Life certainly makes more sense by not having to deal with the discordant, contradictory, and as seen from the outside, preposterous tenets of Christianity. It makes more sense by not having to reconcile the inconsistencies of an all-powerful, all-knowing, loving God with pain, suffering, death, and bad things happening to good people. It makes more sense by realizing that our human existence is so vastly dwarfed by the incomprehensible nature of the universe that ultimate, ultimately meaning, particularly ultimate meaning, is deluded arrogance. Now, I was raised in a Christian family. <clears throat> um, uh, often attending both morning and evening church services on Sunday. By the time I got to high school, um, I intended to study engineering with the intention of working in third world development in association with the church. And by my teenage years, I was aware that I was a Christian because of where I was born. I was born into a Christian family, into a Christian culture, and I was aware that others raised in different settings had different beliefs. I became suspicious of the exclusivity of Christianity, especially since one's religion is so highly correlated with one's place of birth. And after high school, I attended a one-year program at the Baptist Leadership Training School in Calgary. And while at that school, I was particularly influenced by two of the guest teachers, 
one from our mission board and one from Wycliffe Bible translators, who stressed that in the countries where the Canadian Baptist Overseas Mission Board worked, there was no shortage of development and healthcare workers. Churches were growing on their own without missionary help, and that anyone interested in furthering the work of the mission board should specialize in Christian leadership training, not technical or medical services. And the best way to do this, they said, would be to become an experienced minister in order to train ministers in these growing churches. So to make a long story short, I changed directions and set out to train for church ministry. Now my home church, which was First Baptist Church in Red Deer, had a very skeptical view of universities. The quote was, or the thinking was, universities are not good. See how many people leave their Christian faith while they're at university. Hmm, my thought was, at universities, there are smart, educated people who know things. There must be something worth learning there. And then at week one of my university education, week one at Red Deer Junior College, I struggled whether to pursue science and engineering or Christian ministry. I didn't realize at the time how easy it would have been to change courses, change directions through the, but I thought I was heading in one direction and that was it. So I decided to take, in that first week, I decided to take the path to become a minister. But having been alerted by the warnings of the dangers of university in a backward sort of way, I consciously put my Christian faith on the line. And I said to myself, I will pursue Christian ministry, but I'm going to examine my Christian faith. And if it doesn't hold water, I will leave it and find something that does. And during my four year undergraduate work at the University of Calgary, I majored in psychology, but I also took courses in biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, math, philosophy, and six semesters worth of classical Greek language in order later to be able to study the New Testament in the original Greek. I don't know how I had time to do a major in, in anything in, in psychology because of all those other courses that I was taking. I was particularly moved by the history of psychology and the history of psychological thought, also by the Greek philosophy that I was studying and European philosophy. And through all of that, I was introduced to the concept of the God of the gaps, how the range of the unexplicable has consistently shrunk through the ages. We need to attribute so much less to the gods or spiritual forces. There's still so much we don't know, but the shrinking of the gap was apparent and I could extrapolate. So I started to question the integrity of my Christian faith, and I came close to abandoning my plans. But I carried on to seminary to hear the other side of the story, the defense of Christianity. Why? Because I loved Christianity. I loved being a Christian. I loved the Christian life. I loved the community and the fellowship. Uh, during my three years at Acadia Divinity College out in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, I found a way to carry on, basically by becoming theologically liberal. After graduation, I served for four years as a Baptist minister in Southern Manitoba. It was a good experience, and people were sorry to see us leave for work with the Canadian Baptist Overseas Mission Board. After I left there, we had two very unsettled years of waiting for visas to go to Indonesia. My thoughts at the time were, Jesus could heal the sick and the lame. He could walk on water, but apparently he can't deal with Indonesian bureaucrats processing our visa application. Then we got to Indonesia. We spent nine months of full-time language study in the city of Bandung on the island of Java in Indonesia. 
We spent another three months waiting for more paperwork to permit us to move to the police controlled province of West Kalimantan. And finally, we got to our place of ministry. And that all added up to 14 years from entering university to actually getting started on my chosen profession. During the year of language study, a Canadian missionary colleague visited us on his return trip from a church congress, at which time they had adopted a fundamentalist statement of faith. And my colleague thought that I should be aware of this statement of faith. Actually, I think he wanted to ensure, assure himself that I, his junior colleague, accepted the claims put forward in this official statement of faith, which he fully endorsed. At that time, that in that conversation, we were joined by a missionary friend of his from a different church, a different missionary agency, who was dumbfounded that I didn't believe in a literal Satan, that is, an actual spiritual being. And then I learned some months later that this man, again, not, not from our mission agency or our church, not my colleague, at that time that he was questioning how I could possibly be a mission, missionary without believing there was an actual Satan, was having an affair that ended his marriage. I had to scratch my head over that one. And then I found myself working as a liberal in a fundamentalist church with theologically conservative Canadian colleagues. And I had to be careful what I said and how I taught. A couple of times, I, it was a little dicey. But my status at the seminary was underscored by a humorous incident. There was a, a weekend where we were doing a construction work bee, uh, building onto the seminary building. And to do this, we were making cement, mixing cement by hand in the courtyard, in the outdoor courtyard with water from the outdoor baptistry, a big pond of water. Now remember, this, is, this was located approximately two kilometers from the equator at sea level. So everything was done outdoors. And in the process of doing this work bee, mixing the cement, and we had a bucket brigade where we were passing the cement, uh, those buckets of cement up to the third floor. And as we were just passing the buckets, I started asking the question, just joking. And I said, I'm gonna pose a question. Is this cement going to be extra strong because it's made with holy water from the baptistry or is it going to be weak cement because it's made with water that has washed away the sins and it's contaminated by the sins of all of the people that were baptized this past Sunday? And as we're joking about this, one of my colleagues noted the, the principal of the seminary walking by. He called him over and he explained what we were talking about. And the principal said, this is why none of you get to teach theology. And it was good fun. But after the joking, I became vividly aware that indeed, I didn't get to teach theology. And I became aware of how poorly I fit in. But I carried on. I loved the work, the challenges, the ongoing language learning, experimenting with appropriate technologies. We'd worked in gardening, raising chickens as layers and fryers in sand filtration for drinking water, I had a sense that I was making a small difference in that part of the world. So I wasn't in teaching theology, but I was given courses in church history, Christian ethics, music, actually quite a range of subjects, partly because I had the education and the resources, my, my personal library, which was extensive. I had a couple of different encyclopedia on CD, and I could use these resources to quickly put new courses together. And I also learned some computer programming skills in those early days of the personal computers. And I built a program to digitize student records. And I installed a network computers for the seminary administration staff. And the seminary principal found 
theologically non-threatening ways to use my skills. Now, the country of Indonesia has the world's largest population of Muslims, but we were working with the Dayaks, the Aboriginal people of the island known in English as Borneo. The Dayaks are the people formerly known as the wild men of Borneo. Formerly, they were cannibals. And traditionally, the Dayaks have been animists. They hold a worldview much like North American Aboriginal peoples. The world is permeated with spirits that must be acknowledged, placated, and bribed to ensure health, safety, and good harvests. One custom is that when a guest drops into the village house, and the family is eating or the people are eating and it's customary to offer, please come and eat, the standard practice. Um, and if you uh, are invited to eat but decline, the guest says, thank you, I have already eaten and then must respectfully touch the rice bowl to acknowledge the spirits of the rice. Otherwise, disaster might ensue. And, it would, and that prevented, presented a moral dilemma for the Christian seminary students. It's a small thing, but do we acknowledge the spirits and that custom or reject that? Now, in 1996-97, in that part of the world, there was an ethnic cleansing. There was a conflict between the Aboriginal animistic dyaks and the government sponsored migrants from the island of Madura, an aggressively Islamic region of the country. The migrants were given good farming land. The Aboriginal Dayaks were marginalized. The Dayaks are a quiet, passive people, slow to anger. But when they had had enough, they blew up and started attacking and killing the migrants burning their houses. The migrants, the, the Madarese migrants fled to the city of Pontianak where we then lived. They set up refugee camps in the football fields. And I, for my part, channeled a substantial donation from our mission board through the local church to produce or to, to, to purchase rice for these Muslim refugees. And during these ethnic cleansings or during this time, it was scary. There were many reports of reversion to cannibalism. Suddenly, they were no longer the former cannibals. It was actually happening. The violence started on a weekend when our seminary students were out at churches in many remote interior villages and were unable to travel back to the city for several weeks. There were stories from students stranded in these villages during the conflict of villagers playing soccer with the decapitated heads of Madaris migrants. There were stories of the Madaris being pulled from vehicles at the Dayak roadblocks and killed. There were stories of students stranded out in the villages being offered cooked human flesh. And the reaction to the offering was taken as a sign of, are you with us or are you against us? At the very least, like the rice bowl, the student must touch the bowl in acknowledgement of the spirits represented in the cooked flesh. This is a life-threatening moment. Are you with us or are you against us? And these events highlighted vividly the power of their animistic worldview. Now, a few years before this happened, I had started work on the Doctor of Ministry program through Acadia University. And ironically, the program that was intended to make me a better minister was decisive in me leaving Christianity and rejecting religion. There was a significant ethnographic component to my thesis in which I described the traditional folk law that's inter intertwined with the animistic religion and how that cultural background or mindset affected what people heard. 
It was an examination of the disconnect between what ministers and missionaries, both national and international, were saying on the one hand, and what the people heard, two different things. And I realized that the villagers converted to Christianity because they thought they were being offered a more powerful God, one who could rid the crops of blight and ensure a healthy harvest, to keep Christians safe in the jungle trails and on the road, to heal the sick in the absence of medical care. I realized that the Christian God is no more effective at ensuring a good crop or safety on the trail of healing diseases than were the Dyak spirits and gods. Additionally, Christian faith struggles with the problem of evil, particularly why an all-knowing, all-powerful, loving God allows pain, suffering, illness, unfairness, oppression. The Christian God is just as ineffective at providing safety, health, good crops, just, in, just as ineffective as the Dyak spirits. And my doctor of ministry studies, designed to make me a better minister, led me to question the very foundations of my Christian faith. Now, parallel to this, on my return to Canada in 1997, just months after the ethnic conflict that I described earlier, this was in the early days of the internet. And on my return to Canada, I discovered the NASA astronomy picture of the day daily pictures from billions of dollars worth of Earth and space-based telescopes, a picture every day. And for coming up to 24 years now, I have reviewed, or I have viewed the site every day. It's part of my daily morning routine, along with, for the past four years or so, a session of mindfulness meditation. Now, sometime around the year 2000, I was preaching as a guest at a church in Sherwood Park, actually. I was enthralled at that time with the NASA astronomy picture of the day, that amazing sight. And in my sermon, I described the size of the known universe. I took far too much time in my sermon and I went into far too much detail, but I was fascinated by this. And I described the estimated number of stars, or I, I related the estimated number of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. The number of galaxies in the local group of galaxies. The number of local groups of galaxies in the local supercluster of galaxies and the local superclusters relationship with other known superclusters. And that was before the Hubble deep field and the Hubble ultra deep field images that take the estimate of the number of galaxies that we can know about or, or see in the visible universe to two trillion, two trillion galaxies. Now there's a point to this. Well, uh, actually, I, I should add that new research uh, based on the New Horizons uh, spacecraft that uh, flew by uh, Pluto recently uh, brings the estimate down to a mere 200 billion galaxies, only 200 billion galaxies. Now, the point is, in that sermon, I went on to make the point that the creator of these uncountable galaxies loves, cares for, and intervenes on behalf of each individual human. And it was there in the pulpit, as I was expounding this remarkable claim, the absurdity became apparent, and I stopped trying to believe. I stopped trying to make sense of religious faith. And if memory serves me correctly, that was the last time that I preached. I finished my sermon, but that was it. And yet, in light of that, I live every day conscious of a mind-boggling paradox. Every day, I view the NASA astronomy picture of the day in awe, and I am lost in the vastness of space and time. But recently, I was doing some carpentry 
and I hit my thumb with the hammer, and I knew at that moment the exact location of the center of the universe. Now, there's a paradox for you. But that paradox reinforced my daily practice, reinforced by my daily practice of mindfulness meditation, has brought me a degree of still developing equanimity. There might be some sense in life, to life, but when considered in the awareness of the vastness of space and the depth of time, sense is not to be found in a free scientific, evidence-free, human-constructed, human-centered religious belief system. Christian faith doesn't hold water. And so, as I determined, in week one of university, I've given it up and have adopted a materialist, evidence-based, open-ended worldview filled with awe, filled with mystery, filled with unanswered questions. So today, I affirm the legitimacy of the secular, materialist, naturalist worldview. I celebrate that life makes so much more sense by not trying to make sense of it in a religious worldview. And I thank you for the privilege of speaking to you today. Well, thank you very much. As we often do in Unitarian circles, you might see people uh, uh, clapping uh, without sound, but uh, very much appreciated your words. Uh, unfortunately, Larry, you will no longer be able to say that was the last time you uh, preached um, <laughs> outside of Westwood Unitarian congregation, that is. Yeah. That, that was fascinating. Uh, I really, uh, obviously, most of us have not had those kind of unique experiences in foreign countries that you had. But uh, I think that uh, your universal experience of finding meaning outside of formal religions has also been, uh, it resonates at least with myself and, and I think probably a number of others here as well. So, um, Again, thank you, Larry, and uh, I look forward to uh, getting to hear more of your thoughts and insights uh, at the Free Thinkers Book Club. And uh, and if you ever feel like uh, that you just really need to get back to uh, services of some kind, you're always welcome at Westwood. Um, our uh, closing hymn is uh, is uh, and please join us in singing without your uh, uh, microphone on uh, is Blue Boat Home, uh, one of their uh, favorite uh, hymns from the hymn book.
Well, thank you, Sheila. That uh, that's one of my favorite hymns. Uh, you might see the boat in the background, but I've been a sailor for a long time, and always makes me uh, remember good times and the 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 wonder of nature, as you see on the on the ocean. So I'm going to extinguish this cal this chalice at this point and invite you to do the same. And uh, our closing words are by Carl G. Seberg, and he writes, between the dawn and the dusk of our being, let us be brave and loving. In our little passage through the light, let us sustain and forward the human venture in gentleness, in service, and in thought. A reminder that next Sunday service is entitled Pride and Petals, the Beauty of Justice. And this is our annual flower communion service and Pride Month celebration as we gather to celebrate the diversity, the beauty, and the complementary value of the Earth's inhabitants in general and this community specifically. I, I thank you all for joining us uh, the, this, this morning. We hope you can stay and have a conversation and a couple and a cup of virtual coffee or tea.